I will sing of the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. All right. Great to see you this morning. My name's John. Let's sing together. No, I'm kidding. Uh, great to be here. Great to be back home. This is my home, believe it or not. Many of you may have never met me before. How many of you have never met me met personally on a personal note? Okay, great. So I've been busy. Well, Pastor Mark's been over here just kind of hanging out. I've been out busy planting New Life churches. So I can joke like that because he was my roommate. We've known each other for a long time, but it's great to be back and, and, and among you this morning. I, I want to thank uh, Pastor Mark and Pastor Josiah for this opportunity uh, coming up into this uh, a pulpit with some strong men of God and, and to have a chance to share with you my heart. Uh, I pastor the New Life Elgin location, which is the farthest <clears throat> west, and uh, New Life Elgin's backing us up in prayer this morning, and I send greetings from your New Life Elgin family. Just think when you're meeting here, there's, there's thousands of other people out there that are meeting, and it's just great to, great to be a part of a big family. I've been married 32 years. Uh, this year will be 32 years. I met my wife at New Life, believe it or not, on the old, old church, 44th and Pline. I met her in the breezeway. Uh, I, came in, I came in the breezeway of the church, yeah. And I remember I came in for Pastor Mark's um, wedding. I had to get the church uh, kind of prepared, and so I was laying some new carpeting down the center aisle where he, he was going to walk with his beautiful wife, Dee Dee. And I was on my knees, you know, banging in the carpet and doing that kind of thing. We were fixing the church up, prettying it up for the wedding. And <clears throat> in walks this angel. And I'm seriously, I'm down on my knees. I've been on my knees ever since down on my knees, and I look up, and there's my future wife, and she's, I can still picture her to this day. She's got this sundress on that's blue, got this long hair, and I looked up and started to tremble. No. I looked up and thought, this is going to be my wife, and then I just got a bit busy to work, and I just thought, you know, and that was it. Well, later on, we ended up getting married and uh, have three adult kids. They're um, out, and um, and uh, busy raising their own kids. And I have four wonderful grandchildren, and Elijah is my youngest one. Many of you, when I was here for the uh, conference on leadership, uh, I, was, I just found out that morning that Elijah, when he was born that day, uh, went into the emergency room because he wasn't breathing. He's having some troubles. He was in ICU for infants, and I'm supposed to get up and speak. 
and I'm in front of 300 people, and, and I just start bawling. I couldn't hold it in. I tried to fake it. I tried to get my way through it. I just couldn't hold it in. So I started crying and, and uh, really weeping. And, and then you all came up and prayed for me, if you remember that, if you were there. And we, this little guy, Elijah, man, he's destined for something big for God because he was born into this world with 300 leaders at New Life praying for him. So thank you for doing that. He'll be, that's right. <clears throat> He'll be one year old. He'll be one year old coming up here in February. So <clears throat> that's right. Pastor Mark and I have been uh, known each other for a long time. Uh, been roommates for uh, yeah, at early early age there, 17, 18 year olds. Um, I think it was God ordained that we read that. It was my pleasure to lead Pastor Mark to the Lord and to baptize him. Just kidding, just kidding. I'm really proud of him though. He's, he's done a great job, hasn't he? And. Uh, but uh, just we've, we've been busy in ministry together, and uh, we had a chance in the early days to have his dad join us. So Mark's dad, who was a veteran missionary from Spain, joined us on the leadership team. We're a young leadership team. We're in our, we're in our 20s, and, uh, and Bob would speak into our lives and was basically on staff. He reported to his son. It was so strange. as a man of God reporting to his son, but he did. A real humble man. So, I, and he loved people. He was, Bob Job was a man who had fingers the size of like weightlifting bars, you know? And he was just as strong, like a vice grip. You'd shake his hand and like rip your hand off, right? But he loved people. Most of the time his hands were stained with oil. Did you ever get oil on your hands working on a car and you can't get it all out and it gets into the like nooks and crannies of your fingers? You know why his hands were filled like that? Because he was busy changing starters and fixing single for single women's cars in the church. He just had a love for people all the time. Just if you knew him, he had a great love for you. And I thought, you know, as a young 20-year-old guy, you know, I'm thinking, man, I want to grow up to be like Bob Job, if I could just be like him. And at this time, we were, I was, you know, in my, in my, in my mid to late 20s, we were married, we already had our kids. And uh, I thought, man, I want to be like Bob Job. And uh, that day, the doorbell rang. We were in bed. It was like four in the morning. And we're in, living in Marquette Park. And the doorbell rings. And I stumble out of bed. My wife's scared. She's like, who could this be? You know, I go downstairs. And there's this young man that I was discipling. And led him to Christ. and was discipling. He came to me. He goes, I opened the door. And I go, hey, what do you want? He goes, uh, hey, I, Pastor John, Pastor John, I, I just robbed a gas station. And I'm like, uh, well, gee, thanks for coming to my house after doing that. It was really wonderful. And uh, true story, though, I just arrived at a gas station. I said, come on in here, man. And we sat down at the, because we had an apartment up on the second floor on, on Millard over there on Millard on, in Marquette Park. And just started talking to him. And he goes, you know, he goes, I, I robbed the bank, and, but, but I, I felt so convicted. He's a brand new believer. I felt so convicted after the police and everything left. I went back because he got away with the money. He went back and, and I gave the money back to him. Can you imagine being the teller, having your nerves fried? And then the guy comes back in with his mask on and said, here's the money back, you know? So he robbed the bank, restored the money, and came to my house. And I'm like, I want to be just like Bob Job. See what I get? I love this guy. But the story goes further. That two hours later, my phone rings again. And it's Mark Job. He says, hey, John, um, you need to make an announcement this morning in church. This is when we met at Curry High School. Let the church know that we've lost a warrior. He's gone to glory. His dad had passed away. So the day that Bob Joe passes away, the guy I wanted to be like, I have a young man come to my house that had robbed a bank. And I, th I'm not a bank, but a gas station. And I thought, you know, what would Bob Jew do, Job do in this situation? And then it's hammered home. The day that that happens happens to be the day that Bob passed away. And it was like God saying to me, John, you know, you need to love people like Bob did. Love this kid. Pull him in. Talk to him. And that's what I did. And just another, another one of these many, 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 many stories I have about how God had used. Uh, the Job family in my life, and uh, I hope I continue to be able to grow up and be like Bob Job one of these days. So, praise God for that. I just thought I'd share a little story with you.
I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. I'm going to read it, and then we're going to kind of launch in. I want you to strap your seatbelt, and we're going to launch into this passage this morning. Ephesians 1, 3 says this, Who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing? God has blessed us. Praise be to his name. He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Now, that's where we're going. Keep your finger there. We're going to also look at the apex passage, the prime passage for me, which is Ephesians 4, 1 and 2. We're going to talk about that. But I want to ask you this morning, you know, I like to ask the question, why should I listen this morning? Why should you listen? I mean, you could be home prepping up for the, the Bears game. You could be, could be relaxing. You could have slept in a little bit later even if you wanted to. But you're here this morning, and I'm asking my question myself, why would anybody want to listen to me this morning? Well, I'm going to confidently say and unapologetically say that I venture to believe that what the Word of God is saying this morning, and if you're able to grasp the magnitude of it and implement the principles of it, your life will never be the same. What I want to talk about this morning is so vital, so important And especially in a time like this where where there's unprecedented turmoil, where every time we turn on the TV or we open up Facebook, we see a lot of of fighting and, and hurtful words and disharmony going on. And I thought, here we are in the, in the midst of a fast starting out. And if you have any familiarity with the Isaiah 58, the kind of fast that God desires, it's all about relationships. So I thought this morning, let's, let's talk a little. You should listen because I'm going to share with you how to have the healthiest, most edifying, peace-loving, unifying, redemptive, and satisfying relationships in 2021. And something happened to me, and I'm talking about the kind of relationships where I'm talking about family relationships, I'm talking about marriage, I'm talking about employment, I'm talking about church, ministry teams, and neighbors. You name it, any kind of relationship. And yes, even, quote unquote, your enemies. Something happened to me very supernaturally on Monday. I kind of started this fast on Tuesday because I wanted to wean my body off of food and caffeine and sugar so that I didn't get punched in the nose today when my body screams that it didn't get any Giordano's pizza. I'm down here in Giordano's land, Connie's land. Connie's pizza still open? Okay, Maxwell Street Polish, all those good foods. You know, so I started getting ready. But before Tuesday, on Monday, I don't know if it's ever happened to you before. I sat in my chair where I'm getting ready to pray, and I felt, and I just, it was one of those moments where it was a God moment. I sensed in my spirit, John, you need to call this particular person that you haven't talked to in a long time. And I'm like, I don't want to call that person. You know, it's kind of one of those attitudes where the ball's in your court. I didn't want to initiate it, but God said, call this person. Talk to this person. So I did. I talked to this person and I said, you know, basically I know I've not been the best and I explained the situation. I said, I'm sorry, forgive me. I want to just make sure, you, never, you don't need to respond to me. You don't, I just want to make sure that I enter into 2021 in a, in a good and healthy relationship with you. And this person said back to me, it's not a problem, don't worry, don't worry about it. Love's a two-way street and... and uh, he goes, it's really, he goes, it's really good that you call me because I've been in the hospital all week with congestive heart failure. This was a, a dear, dear person to me. We all have those, you know, just because I'm a pastor doesn't mean I'm perfect, okay? Let's get that straight real quick. It was one of those kind of things where I just, you know, I'm not going to call you, man. You call me. You know what? I'm from Chicago, dude. You know? <laughs> Don't mess with me. But God, if you're a wrestler, he put me into a full Nelson. Put me down, pinned me, and said, you're not moving anywhere, buddy, until you initiate love like I've initiated love in your life. Having no clue, this person was having congestive heart failure. And he said to me, you know, the Lord wanted you to get in touch with me. Isn't that stunning? 
And what I'm saying this morning is if you can grab hold of what I'm getting ready to talk about, if you can grasp it and you have the guts, the courage, the faith to humble yourself and implement it, it will change your life. It'll change your relationships. And to get us there, I have to navigate through a lot of Scripture. But we've looked at the key thing, the key verse already, 1-3, but there's also Ephesians 4, 1 and 2. We'll talk about that in a minute. But I want to ask you a question. I want you to write down on a piece of paper or in your mind, lock this in. I want to ask you something. What is the most important thing in your life? What is the most important thing to you? I would call it precious. Precious. Okay? the most important thing to you. That if this thing were taken away from you, you would struggle badly. What would it be? Write it down, think it down, got your answer. Now I know some of you probably wrote down that if the most precious thing to me is that the Bears win today in the playoffs. That's the most precious to me. If you're Lord of the Ring fans, you know where I'm going there. Or some of you wrote down, you know, my most precious thing, let me think about that. That's not that hard. It's my parking spot in the wintertime when I shovel it out, make sure I put a couple car, uh, chairs there and you know, brooms and stuff, and tsh, tsh, nobody better <laughs> take my spot because that's precious to me. Maybe it's your pet gerbil. I, I don't know. Or maybe it's an Italian beef from Portillo's. You can tell I'm fasting because I got a bunch of food illustrations here. You know? <laughs> maybe it's a large you know, Italian beef just saturated with jardinera, some sweet peppers on that too, and then dip that thing. Double dip. It's like you're swimming in that, you know, with some crispy hot French fries from Portillo's. And wash it all down with a milkshake. I'm with you. A cake shake, whatever, and then go take a nap. You're going to sleep through the Bears game. You're not going to win on that one. Maybe that's the most precious thing to you, right? But I hope, I hope that when I asked that question, you wrote down a relationship of some sort. That if this relationship was taken from me, I would struggle badly. I think that if there's anything that COVID has taught us is that life is precious. Even if you don't know anyone who's passed, the whole isolation piece is difficult. And it's taught us that life is and relationships are the most important thing to us. When you really think about it, get down to the brass tacks. Who cares about anything else really other than the precious relationships that God allows you to have in your life? When I, when I really want to bring this home, as I was thinking this through, I said, what's the best way to feel this kind of precious relationship as it relates to God. And I thought about a parent. If you're a parent, right, you love your kids, and you see your kids sick. Not, I'm talking not about a sniffle. I'm not talking about scratching their knee because they're playing jumping jacks or something. No, I'm talking about a kid who's, who's hurting, real ill, or dying, or has cancer. And you think as a parent, something inside of you, when you see that, it's true, isn't it? When you see that, something clicks. And it's like, if I could just take that away from you, if I could just absorb that into myself, if I could just take your illness, if I could just take your sickness, if I could just carry your pain, because I love you, see. If you're a parent, if you're a mother, you, 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 you understand that. And that's the closest that I can get to describing the love of God. That the love of God is so great that he says, I, I see you in, in your illness and I see you in your sickness and I, I, I will come in and, and I, I will take that from you. I want to carry that. And so this relates to having healthy relationships because as Paul writes the book of Ephesians, in the first three chapters, he's, he's, he's basically dismantling and opening up and helping us to see the gospel and how it affects and saturates just like that Portillo sandwich, saturates every aspect of our lives, specifically our relationships. God loves you like that, like a parent to the child, but even bigger and better and cleaner, more holy, 
The Bible says that God loved the world. No. The Bible says that God so loved you and me. That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We're able to love because God loved us. And this is foundational to healthy relationships, so bear with me. I'm not, I'm not going to act like we have a bunch of baby Christians in here. I'm expecting you to be self-feeders. I'm expecting you to take notes. I'm expecting you to drill down after this sermon this morning on this passage. We are able to love because he first loved us. So part of having healthy relationship is understanding God took the initiative and he pursued you with a great love. He took the initiative. He pursued you. He was the one that sought you out. When I was getting ready to, when I came to a point after a couple years, getting ready to, to, to date my wife and get married in my mind, I'm praying. And, uh, and I remember that I thought my wife was, my to-be wife, Chris, was strange. It's like, man, every time I get around this girl, she walks away from me. She's like the queen of hard to get. I had no intentions to, you know, just like, like, man, every time she walks away. And finally, you know, at Archview Restaurant. How many of you know Archview Restaurant? All right. Believe it or not, back in the days, our whole church would go there and eat after church. It's a true story. At Archview Restaurant, after, after you know, I took her aside and I just, hey, you know, in the parking lot there, I said, hey, you want to go get a cup of coffee? And she's thinking it's all ministry related. I said, no, let's just Get to know each other a little bit. So we went to the Hickory Pit. How many of you remember the Hickory Pit? Some of my old-timer friends, right? In Bridgeport, which is tore down now, right across from McGuane Park. Don't put an old, don't put an old Chicago guy up here, because he's going to tell you all the stories, right? The point I'm getting, and we, went, we had Spumoni and, and, and coffee, and that was the beginning of a 1,000 cups of coffee. A 1,000 cups of coffee, here I am later. But the point is this. All along, she had a crush on me. She confessed this later. And I don't blame her. I mean, she had a confession. She had a, she had a crush on me. I really don't blame her for that. I mean, I'd have a crush on me too if I was me. <laughs> but she was just waiting for me to take the initiative. I had no clue. I thought, man, this girl's weird. Every time I try to get around her, she, just, she walks away and stuff. I'm like, you know, finally I trapped her in an archery restaurant and said, hey, you want to get a cup of coffee? You know, and spumoni and coffee and three kids and four grandkids later. God took the initiative. God meets you where you're at. He's got you here today. Not by coincidence. He's in pursuit of you. And his love's a lot bigger and greater and better than any human could ever offer you or ever will. As a matter of fact... When you are out carousing around and you are steeped in idolatry with misplaced priorities and you thought you were living the good life, you didn't know that you were in darkness and lost and with no hope. It was at that moment that God all along, now you can see it, can't you? Now that you've known God, now that you've come to know God through his son Jesus, you can see now that all along God was pursuing you. Why? Because he loved you. As Stott, the theologian, says, long before it ever occurred to you to turn to God, while you were lost in the dark and sunken in sin, God takes the initiative. He rises from his throne, lays aside his glory, and stoops down to seek until he finds. God has raised himself up off of the throne and has stooped down and became man and dwelt among us and found us. He sought us out. Why? Because he loved us so much. You've got to get this because Paul spends three chapters in the book of Ephesians to get to the point where he finally tells us how to have healthy relationships. And if you're starting to connect the points, you're going to begin to see now that part of having a godly, healthy relationship with everybody that's within your sphere of influence is to understand deeply that you are loved by God and that the gospel goes beyond the cross and breaks out much more. That's the kind of God he is. Paul writing to Timothy, said, hey, here's a trustworthy statement. You want, you want some truth in a day of deceit and uncertainty? Here's a trustworthy saying. Here's something that's worthy of memorizing. This deserves full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. 
like you and me. And if you don't think you're a sinner, well, just ask somebody that knows you and they'll confirm whether or not you are. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. He's that kind of God. The gospel is so rich and deep. So deep that even, that even God would leave the 99, the shepherd, Jesus, the shepherd, the pastor, he would leave the 99 and go after the one the sheep that is lost. Listen to, listen to this, just powerful, because I want you to hear the heart of God this morning. Just touch, just touch points. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has 100 sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors and together says, Hey, rejoice with me. I found my lost sheep. I'm so excited about it. This is, this is Jesus opening his heart and saying, This is my heart. This is the heart of God. That I love you that much. Rejoice with me. And Jesus says, I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons that do not need to repent. Isn't that beautiful? Listen to me now. I know that in a crowd like this, I know that in a crowd that's like online this morning, that you haven't just, that you haven't just come here uh, by coincidence, that, that in a crowd like this, there's some out there that you know full well that God is pursuing you. You know that he has taken the first initiative, that he's, that he's coming for you, not out of fear, not with a big bat ready to pound you over the head because of your sinfulness. He's coming as a father that loves you because you're lost and he wants to pull you out of the domain of darkness and bring you into the kingdom of light, the kingdom of his beloved son. Will you yield to that this morning? How long are you going to live in that lost state? Be compelled and motivated by the love of God. That's the good news. God has found us. He regained possession of us through a payment, the cross, and the blood of his son, Jesus. Now, the gospel doesn't just stop there. It's accomplished great things. Ephesians 1, 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing. Paul is now unpackaging the gospel with these believers in Ephesians. He's getting into the details of what the gospel is and has accomplished beyond forgiveness. It's interesting that the, the church that lost their first love in Revelation is the Ephesian church. It's the one criticism against a great church. And it's these things, it's the simplicity of the gospel that they had lost. They had lost the fervency, the newness, the awareness of what took place at the cross that they accepted and believed in and, and it broke out into so many, way beyond the cross, so many great things occurred because of the gospel and were accomplished, but they had lost it. So Paul is, is unpackaging this and he's saying to these people, here is the gospel. It's kind of like Paul's taking an engine apart, an exploded view. Those of you that are mechanics, those of you that understand cars, you see an engine, you see the exploded view, it's a break up this screw, that washer, this screw, this is how this works, here's the carburetor, here, and here's how it all kind of comes together. What Paul's doing is he's giving an exploded view in Ephesians chapter one through three, and he's explaining the details, so to speak, of how the car works. It's not just the car getting us to the grocery store, it's so much more. It's not just the cross accomplishing forgiveness, there's so much more. It's like a surgical intern or an apprentice or residence. During their training, they become saturated in all the knowledge and nuances of their particular trade. Here, Paul, with great joy and passion, is saturating. He's filling up the Ephesian believers with all the implications of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And oh, do we need to be saturated. You know what saturated means? That's the double dip. It's saturated. That's taking a cup of coffee and pouring a whole bag of sugar in it. <sharp inhale> Coffee's gone. It's brown sugar. It's saturated. That cup of coffee's saturated. It's gone. The sugar's saturated now. And what he's saying here is that the gospel is what gives us the empowerment to have healthy relationships. And if you want to dig further and deeper, 
yourself, you can go to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 through 14. Listen to just a couple quick, I'll name them real quickly. You drill down, you study them a little bit further. By the way, these, these truths of all the prison officials, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, have really radically changed my life. Because when I first came to Chicago, you know, I came from a, lot, a broken family. I came from a lot of brokenness. I had, I don't know how many stepfathers. I lost count of them, about four or five, I don't remember. Just, just bounced around in a lot of instability. Knew the Lord. Knew that I was called to be a pastor, but there was some brokenness that needed to be healed up. And in the midst of all that, I needed to know. I finally came to a crisis point in McKinley Park, walking around praying. And I realized at that moment that I needed to know and understand the love of God in my life in a deep way. And it's the truth of the gospel, expanded, expanded view, exploded view, that began to transform me. When I really began to understand that God loves me, when I really began to understand that God values me, when I really began to understand that God wouldn't leave me or forsake me, that, that, that I had to get that rooted in my system and it began to cha- change me, that God chose me to be holy and blameless. That shame, listen to that word, shame was taken away. That I was predestined to be adopted. I had such value that God adopted me into his family that I was blessed in the beloved, accepted in the beloved, accepted by Jesus. Some of you just need to know this morning that you're accepted. (laughs) You're accepted, man. You're not the last guy picked on the team, okay? Not anymore. Redemption, I've been rescued. I've been, he's made known to me the mystery of his will. I have spiritual insight now. I'm no longer in darkness and ignorance that I've obtained an inheritance. I have a purpose today. I have a future tomorrow. These are all the beautiful things. And he goes further into chapter two and three. And it's what I call the gospel saturation. And what I'm saying is that during this fast, I'd like to see you pray through the book of Ephesians. I'd like to see you meditate through it, pray through it. And understand all that he's done because it's going to have a huge impact on you relationally. So based on all the gospel that is done, now you need to live it out. All that has taken place in chapter 1 through 3, now live it out. Live it out. Where? Where do you live it out? All those good things, the good things that God has done. You live it out in the hardest, most difficult place that you could live it out. And that is in your relationships, not hidden away somewhere in a monastery away from people. No, live out the gospel where it is the hardest and where it matters the most, and that is in your relationships. So how do we have these healthy relationships? Well, here we are. We're finally at the apex verse, chapter 4, verse 1. Accept that God expects you to live a holy life relationally. Listen to what it says. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. So based on everything that God has done, now live out the gospel through all of 2021. I mean, we're in a tough age right now. We're in a unique situation. I've never seen anything like this in my 57 young years like I see it now. And it's it's, it's unfortunate. But But if of all people, shouldn't we be the ones that are the unifiers the ones that shine the light the brightest, the ones that have the healthiest, most redemptive and peace-loving relationships within this church, first within the nucleus of our family, within our body of church, and outside, even among those that we disagree with, I think it's true. And that kind of living is called gospel saturation. It's understanding all that God has done, the cross and everything beyond the cross, to a point where now, It leaks into and saturates my life. It affects my approach to life. It affects my tone and my perception of people around me, even those that I disagree with. I kind of like to call it the gospel catapult, that all that Jesus has done for me, wow, 
It's not just always about me anymore now. The gospel has, has done all these great things. God has done all these, and he's given me now the capacity that in, my, that in every aspect of my life, I can now enter into relationships that I care about the most, that are the most precious to me, and I have the empowerment of the gospel to live that out. It's called living the gospel beyond the cross. Live a life worthy of your calling that you have received. So how do we do that? Pastor John, really cool. Yeah, yeah, cool. You went to Moody, big deal. But how do I live this out in my life, man? I'm, my nerves are still fried. My relationships are fact are fractured. My ex is driving me nuts. I'm going through a divorce. I haven't talked to my kids in over two years. I can't see my grandkids anymore because my kids are mad at me. You name it. How do you, how do you, how do you enter in? How do you take responsibility? How do you initiate the love? How do you initiate reconciliation? How do you, how do you step in and become a peacemaker once again? Well, the text says it. He mentions all this gospel beauty, and then in chapter 4, he brings it home. Be completely humble. Walk in humility. If you want to do a good study in humility, just study the life of Jesus. Philippians is a good book. But be careful in your humility. You want to walk in humility. In your relationships, humble yourself. In other words, never fall for the seductive trap of thinking that you are smarter and better and more righteous and that you're always right. <laughs> you ever meet a person who always thinks they're right? They're like the most wrong person <laughs> in the world, man. You're wrong because you think you're right all the time, man. Are you ever wrong? Are you ever like me, a sinner? Have you ever messed up? Mr. Self-righteous. Mr. Too Proud to admit that you're wrong, man. Okay? <laughs> I love this quote. Gospel saturation, humility. Listen to this. Humility, think about this in the context of your spouse, your kids, your coworkers, your ministry team partners that you work with. Think about this now. Let's apply it. Humility in our relationships. It's very practical. It's very doable. Humility is a fruit of the rule of the gospel in your life. The gospel will humble you because it requires you to confess that the greatest dangers in your life live inside of you, not outside of you. The gospel calls you to run to God for rescue because your greatest problem is you. The gospel tells you that no matter how long you have known the Lord or no matter how successful you have been in his work, you need his grace right now as much as you did the first moment you believed. The gospel doesn't work to make you independent and self-reliant, but willingly dependent on God, and listen, and the community of grace he has placed you in. We need to be a people, as we face the world that we're in, and as we live within the church that we are in, and that God has placed us, to be humble. And I'm talking to everybody in this church. And don't you, make this, don't you dare make the mistake that... Man, I'm glad pastor's preaching on that. My husband really needs to hear that one. Man, be listening, stop sleeping. Don't you dare do that. Because this isn't about anybody else. You listening? Online, you listening? This isn't about anybody else but you. That's your problem. You're worried about everybody else. Everybody else needs to be more humble. Yeah, if they were just a little more gentle. You know? No, it's about you. Walk in humility. I think that a lot of relationship battles would be resolved immediately if we could all just humble ourselves and initiate love and forgiveness as God did through Jesus. I mean, think about that phone call. Here I am, I come under conviction of the Holy Spirit. I can't move anymore. And I reach out to this person and they say, thank you. I reach out to this person because I needed to reconcile with them. And they said, thank you. For the last week, I've been in the hospital with congestive heart failure. Had no clue. See, it's humbling ourselves. It's taking the initiative. Authenticity goes a long way with people. You know that. To admit your fears, to admit your failures, to admit you're not always right. And then he says, be gentle. Think about gentleness in a relationship. 
spurred by the gospel, spurred by the life change, spurred by the fact that God has redeemed you, chosen you, made you his son, made you his daughter. Now I can walk with gentleness. Gentleness goes hand in hand with humility. When you understand your own sin and your capacity to sin, you're going to be a lot more gentle towards people. It's going to come out of your mouth. Gentle. When you understand that you are a sinner, when you understand that you have the capacity to sin and to hurt God and hurt people, then it causes you to be a lot more gentle as you deal with people. It's going to flow from your hands and your mouth, especially towards those who've been caught in sin, who've fallen into sin, and they, they've experienced and been entangled in sin and, and its ugly consequences. It's a lot more... Easy to be gentle with that person, a a humility and a gentleness. And here we go, patience. She says, be completely humble, gentle, and be patient. Listen carefully this morning. Patience is an undeniable requirement of being a Christ follower. You could even say patience is part of your calling. It's part of how you're called. You're called to be patient. It's part of your destiny. It's part of God's expectation. It's a a mandate from God. James chapter 5, James James clarifies it real easy. I want you to listen now. I want you to think about relationships. Sometimes we get impatient. What sabotages our patience is that we we have an agenda set. We have a goal set. We're goal-oriented. We're achievement-oriented. When we don't hit it, we we know it doesn't land when we think it should. We hurt people. We step on them to get to where we want to go because we're not able to be patient. We're not able to step back a little bit. Calm down. Tranquilo, muchacho. That's about all the Spanish I know. <laughs> Tranquilo, muchacho. Pastor Mark used to say that to me all the time. And then I'd say, right back at you, bro. <laughs> Listen to how James breaks it down. I want you to think in your relationship. Where does this apply? Where's God putting his finger this morning on you? Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too... Be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble, and I hope you're listening. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Be patient and stop grumbling towards one another. Stop grumbling against each other, brothers and sisters. This is where it hits me. Or you'll be judged. The judge standing at the door, not standing at the door, waiting. He's not saying I'm gonna. You know, these are the believers. He's saying what this is saying is God is standing right on the outside of the door, and He's listening in, and He hears your grumbling that you think nobody else can hear, but you and Siri. <laughs> and maybe Apple's spying on you. I don't know. But in the text here, James is saying the judge, who's not going to judge you to condemn you, but he surely is going to discipline you. When you grumble and complain against one another, be careful because the judge is on the other side of the door and he's listening in. And he's not going to judge you to condemn you, but he is going to discipline you. He's going to give you a smackdown. You ever been smacked down by somebody? I know most of you husbands have been by your wives. But he's going he's to be some discipline. And usually the discipline is painful. I should tell you if I had time the many stories of when I've tried to run from God. And it's been painful to have me back. If you could just know the pain I've gone through by the, times, the many times I've tried to run from God, it's astounding. God disciplines those he loves. And he's saying, be patient. Be patient. Stand firm because the Lord's coming is near, and it is. Don't grumble against one another. Must be a problem near the end days, brothers and sisters among Christians, or you will be judged. Brothers and sisters, in his example of patience and face of suffering, if you're going through suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and he's full of mercy. That's the beautiful thing. God is is a God of compassion. So he's telling us here to be humble, to be gentle, and to be patient, and to not do it alone. Back to Ephesians, he says, Bear with one another in love. Bearing with one another. So be patient, be gentle, be humble, and bear with one another in love. Listen, life can be crushing, can it? But you're to bear with one another. You need others in your life because life has a way to crush you. 
You bear with one another despite your differences. I, I came up with this definition that resonates with me. Bearing with one another. Graciously walk together in an understanding way even if there are things about you that irritate me. I'm going to still bear with you even though there's things about you that may irritate me. You put the toilet paper on where it goes out the front. You put, I put it on where it goes out the back. You squeeze the toothpaste in the middle. You know, I don't like, I like to keep, put the cap on. You don't like to put the cap. In other words, I'm just being silly here, but I'm saying bear with one another. Do this journey together because life is crushing. Lock arms, stand firm, and walk in humility. Bear with one another in love. And then lastly, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. The unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Remember Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount? He said, blessed are the peacemakers, right? For they shall be called what? The sons of God. The people who pursue peace and seek peace are called the sons of God. It's the distinctive of being a child of God is that you seek to be a peacemaker. You're the one that seeks peace. You're the one that takes the initiative. Peace is cultivated and grows, and Lord knows we need peace in this world today. It's grown in the context of forgiveness. All relationships require the practice of forgiveness. And it is a shame that many of us have gone years with never talking to one of our parents, have gone years leveraging our kids against their grandparents, have gone years pushing off and trying to suppress the voice of God, the tone of his voice that's been saying to you for a long time, call your brother, talk to your sisters. In these last days, haven't we had enough? Haven't we seen enough to know what our priorities really are? And they are relationships. God said this, didn't he? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. God's priority is love me and love people. Love me and love people. Be like Bob Job. He would have opened his door up, let that guy in that robbed the gas station, talked to him a bit, navigated him through it, and stuck with him. That young man's dead now. But love people. See, within the environment of forgiveness, it's where, it's where we need to understand that forgiveness means release. It's letting go of the offender. It's letting go of the offense, and it's trusting God for the outcome. If you think forgiveness is this, yeah, you know, I, I'm going to forgive them. I forgive them. I forgive them. No. Forgiveness is a release. It's this, which I had to learn in another one of my prayer walks through McKinley Park 30 years ago, was, God, I forgive this person. And I remember, the Spirit led me to make a fist, and I just... And everybody else that was in the park probably thought I was a nutcase. One of those kind of people who just talked to themselves like this, you know, walking around like this. Like, who's that wacko man? And I was just interested in their ad and cheddar that they were cooking that smelled so good, you know. Isn't it interesting when you walk through McKinley Park, the ad and cheddar in the summertime in July, it just smells wonderful. It's like I could just hang out on everybody's blanket and eat a taco and be happy. But there I was, walking through the park like this. No, I'm kidding. But I was walking to the park with my, and, and I just said, you know, God, and I, had to, I really had to forgive this person. They, they had hurt me in my life. And, and it, was, it was painful and, and built a lot of instability in me. And it was tough. It was hard, man. It was emotional. It was intertwined. It was visceral. It was all tied into me. And I just remember just opening my hands and saying, I forgive. I release this person. I name their name. And I had to do it 70 times, seven times. I, had, I just didn't come like, phew, wow, that was great. I applied that sermon principle I heard on Sunday, and everything's great now. No, let's get real, man. Let's get into real life. You may have to ask 70 times, seven. You just keep doing what's right. You just keep doing what God tells you to do, and there will be a breakthrough. 
There will be a breakthrough. I had to pray that and release it so I don't have to pray it anymore. I don't have to pray it anymore. You see, within the environment of forgiveness, unity thrives. And he's saying, you know, bear with one another, make every effort, not a little bit of effort, not some effort, not minimal effort, not 90%. Make every effort, 100% effort, to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And brothers and sisters, I want to tell you, one of our greatest challenges will be maintaining unity in our marriages, families, church, community, and nation. And we are the people that are first called to the front lines to be unifiers and peacemakers. We've got to come to terms with that. And we're on the verge of a fasting season that is corporate. We're calling the leaders of New Life Community Church are calling a corporate fast to not eat food for a period of time so that you would seek the face of God, that you would humble yourself and seek him, that there would be a God breakthrough in our lives and marriages, church, and nation. Will you be a part of that? Will you be serious enough about reconciling your relationships? Scroll scroll, scroll down, I'm almost done here. Listen to what the text says in Ephesians 4, our key passage, right? He's making the transition, which is interesting. After chapter 3, into chapter 4, he talks about how to get along as a husband and wife, how the children should treat their parents, how to deal with spiritual warfare, which is on an increase. He talks about all these things, but he bases it on the solid ground of Calvary and all the implications thereof. Listen to what he says here. I can't can't not say this. It's too important for me to skip. Verse 25, Therefore each of you must put off falsehood. Stop lying to one another. Stop being fakers. And speak truthfully to your neighbor. For we are all members of one body. So you can't have dishonesty in a relationship where there's oneness. If we're, there's oneness and there's, a, and, there's, and there's a dishonesty between us, it's a wedge between us. The communication can't get through. There, it's not reflective of the triune God who's totally unified. That's why unity is a big deal. So he's saying make every effort and speak the truth. Stop speaking falsehood. Do not let the sun go down. He says in your anger do not sin Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give who a foothold. Do not give the devil a foothold. Talk about a foothold. Listen, he's like a, the devil's kind of like, no offense to vacuum vacuum cleaner salesmen, I bet you there's none out there anymore so I can say this, but, you know, if you you, you hear doorbell rings and it's not the Amazon guy, it might be the vacuum cleaner salesman. And what he's going to try to do is get one foot in that door. So you can buy a $1,200 vacuum cleaner, and it breaks in two months. I'm speaking from experience. I bought one. I said, oh, another story. Anyways, so the devil wants to get one foot in. Why? His attempt is not just to get one foot in through your unresolved anger, through your, through your lack of, of humility to seek forgiveness and take the initiative. The devil gets his foot, first foot in. And his ambition, his goal as a destroyer and as a liar is to get his whole body in and wreak chaos in your family. you got to start shutting the door, for goodness sake. And you can do it right now. And you say, Pastor, I can't make that phone call. Then you need to fast and ask God to help you to make that phone call. Amen? You need to seek to reconcile You need to seek to humble yourself because blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called and identified and characterized. They are the sons of God. Peacemakers. All things Jesus could say that it would be a characteristic of a son of God would be peacemaker. Wow. And do not give the devil a foothold. Verse 28. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. Stop dropping bombs that start with well, I won't go there. Stop dropping bad words. <laughs> Don't let any unwholesome talk, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs. That it may benefit those who listen and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness 
rage and anger. He's writing to brothers and sisters here. He's writing to the redeemed, the holy people of God, where there's been a work of the gospel, but he's saying, work it out further, work it out further. Know it better, know the height of it, know the depth of it, know the width of it, be established in it, and evidence it where it's hardest to evidence it, which is in your relationships. That's, we got to get there. We've got, this is basic 101. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness. Get rid of it. Rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgiving each other, just as Christ God forgave you. Could you just say to the person next to you, be kind. It's going to be hard for some of you who had a fight on the way to church this morning. Just say, be kind. Now, be kind, will ya? Be kind, will ya? Where's my cigarettes, by the way? <laughs> I don't know where that came from. It wasn't in my notes. <laughs> you shouldn't have gave me this pulpit, Pastor Mark. Remember this as musicians make their way forward. Remember this, that humility and patience and gentleness, bearing with one another, are all the outworking of the gospel. You cannot white-knuckle your way into being a patient person. You can't try harder to be gentle. You can't be a patient person without the power of the Spirit, something greater than you. These Unity, you can't be a unifier. These things aren't meant to be standalones. They're meant to be flowing out of a life that's gospel-saturated. It's, it's the gospel beyond forgiveness. It's the gospel being lived out. So therefore, I could live a life in such a way where I don't grieve the Holy Spirit that's within me, but the Holy Spirit flourishes with inside of me. The Holy Spirit opens up and begins to bear forth the kind of fruit that frankly, our world needs to see. It needs to be us that are the ones that love. By this shall all men know you are my disciples. By what? By your love for what? One another. And even your enemies and those you disagree with. Now, now there, this is our testing time. This is our moment. We're calling a fast not by coincidence, not out of rote just because it's written into a calendar. We're calling a fast to say, seek the face of God and will you take whatever that specific thing in a relationship that you need to take, will you bring it before God this morning? What phone call do you need to make? Who do you need to call today? Who do you need to send a text to? What's... What's God asking you to do this morning via relationship? So you can't sustain humility and gentleness and patience by yourself. It's God, gently as a father, putting his finger on this area of your life. He's saying, here's an area here, and here's, here's the straight line relationship to somebody you need to talk to. Here's an area, you know, you've been, you, you've been so cocky and arrogant and you got so much pride in your life that, that I, I want you to humble yourself. Humble yourself before me. What is it that God's saying? What relationship needs to be reconciled? Maybe you need to have a better grasp that God loves you so that from there you can catapult into a life of rich spiritual gospel living. Maybe that's where you need to be. So I'm saying before we go into this fast, deal with your relationship issues. Deal with them. I mean, God had to set me in a, in a headlock and say, you're not getting any further than here, John, because I started fasting on Tuesday last week. And it was Monday that God said, you're not going any further than, than this day unless you make this contact with this particular person and that you say this. And I did. I had to. I had to. I'm so glad I did. I had no idea that person was in the hospital with congestive heart failure. And I love that person. But I let some stuff get in there. And I know that I'm, I know, I know that, I know, look, listen to me. 
This is the third time I've, I've taught this message. And every time so far, somebody's come up to me and said, Pastor, I haven't been able to see my grandkids. I'm struggling with my son. I've had two people tell me that. And they're just, they're just mad and they, they, won't, they won't let us see the grandkids. And I've done so much for my kid. And I've heard that multiple times. Don't you think that you can humble yourself this morning? That you could get out of your seat, stand up, walk down the aisle, come to this altar right before the fast and seek the face of God. Lay it out. Lay it down. Say, so here it is, God. Whatever it is, what the Spirit knows how to speak. He's speaking this morning. He's speaking to you right now.
and I will make room for you to do whatever you want to to do whatever you want to and I will make room